Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. This is David Bonson. I am the Chief Investment Officer and the Managing Partner here at the Bonson Group, and we are preparing to end what has been um, a week that many people will never forget, and I am on that list as are all the members of my team and a good portion of our clients. Uh, of course, I'm sure that there are plenty of investors, not plenty, but some, small minority at this point, that may not even know what's transpired this week because they really are pretty disconnected from the day-to-day -day of their portfolio. But um, with a week like this, that tends to bring even the most sidelined of investors off the sidelines to some degree. Um, I don't want, I want to say, and it's a little bit of a risk, but I did it on purpose to be recording this uh, before the market is closed on Friday. Uh, the market is closing in another hour and a half or so. Um, and I've already uh, completed my Dividend Cafe written version. I wrote, uh, um, I've kind of written, I think, four different ones this week because of just everything that's been going on with the markets. And, and so as far as um, what I want to dedicate this podcast to, uh, I kind of want to recap um, a number of things from the written Dividend Cafe, but just also a lot of the kind of behavioral elements uh, and, and emotional, psychological, practical things going on right now. So let me just get right to it. I'm sorry for kind of the dilly-dallying. I, I, I don't recall the last time I had a week where I've slept less than this, and that's fine. I feel, I feel um, you know, I, I have plenty of energy, but I definitely am, am a little worn mentally. But, um, you know, this is, this is part of the life I chose. And it is part of the life that every investor chose if they chose to be involved in equities. Um, but for myself, being involved in equities on behalf of, of hundreds of clients, hundreds of people with, with dreams and with goals and with financial expectations, it's a bit different. Um, I haven't spent two seconds this week thinking about my capital. Um, I am buying equities in my own account heavily as I'm buying equities in certain other clients' accounts that have the the stomach for such thing. I don't. I don't do that right now with any expectation that we've seen a bottom. Um, as I'm sitting here talking right now, the market's up over 800 points. Uh, it's been up about a thousand. It's been. It, it had gone up a thousand. Went all the way back down to zero. Now back up again. And President Trump is going to be speaking in another 45 minutes. And I think that we've mostly uh, heard now what he's going to say. But you just never know. Um, so, you know, are we going to rally into the close? Are we going to stay flat where we are? Or are we going to sell off in the close? I mean, I, all three are possible. So the market, uh, first and foremost, let's just say you've been taking a nap for a couple of weeks and you woke up and the first thing you did is listen to this podcast. Um, the market went down 4,000 points, uh, what, what seems like eternity ago now, but it was th three weeks ago, the week of three weeks ago. And then last week, the market was up a bit, but it was up 1,000, down 1,000, up 1,000, down 1,000, squeaked out a 400-point um, gain on the week with a lot of volatility. So we called week one uh, a slide, and we called week two a roller coaster, and then week three has had some roller coaster elements, but many more slides in that roller coaster, uh, two of them with a point of utter violence, and that was Monday which uh, on Monday was the worst day on a percentage basis in the market since, two, since October of 2008. And then um, yesterday, Thursday, became the worst day in the market, down 10% on the day, uh, worst day since October of 1987, the infamous Black Monday. So um, equities all entered an official bear market from a closing point to a closing point. NASDAQ, S&P, Dow all down over 20%. And in fact, now from their peak levels down um, in the Dow's case, it was 25% coming into today. S&P was like 23 or 24. Um, now, you know, both indexes, as I talk, are up three or four percent, so that will be adjusted a little. But my point being um, that this uh, the shock and awe and the rapidity at which 
uh, the coronavirus issue, um, and more particularly the 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 market's fears of what our response to coronavirus would mean to the economy. So you had a barrage of news this week of uh, NBA season being suspended, of uh, now golf tournaments being suspended, in some case canceled, March Madness, um, one of my favorite events of the year being canceled altogether, obviously just a massive amount of travel being canceled, and um, so forth and so on. So you do have uh, an absolute decimation coming in economic activity in late Q1 and certainly well into Q2. Uh, will that last into Q3? I mean, this really is the major question facing the economy, facing so much of our society, and facing uh, the stock market. Um, because you, I, I believe both of these scenarios I'm about to lay out for you are possible. One is that you have a big move down in Q1, uh, going into Q2. Q2 would be where it's hit much worse. Um, and that most of that creates pent-up demand. Um, people work from home, they cancel trips, they reschedule conferences, they reschedule vacations. And then in Q3, uh, you have a utterly parabolic rebound in GDP. Um, I would no way in the world would bet against that outcome. But I also would not bet um, with high conviction for it because of the basic reality of uncertainty. We just simply don't know. Um, the quickness by which a lot of improvement medically has been taken uh, hold in South Korea, China, um, gives a lot of people hope. The various treatment possibilities, therapeutic options that are on the table. I can talk more about that next week gives a lot of people hope. Uh, there's no vaccine coming online anytime soon. So there's just uncertainty. And I'm going to divide up, as I did at DividendCafe.com, uh, four categories of what's going on, but how which, uh, by, for how investors can kind of interpret and understand the coronavirus issue right now. Um, and one is the most important, and that is from just the healthcare ramifications. Uh, President Trump this week cut off uh, any travel from Europe. Now, was it the right thing to do or wrong thing to do from a policy standpoint with healthcare? Let's just assume it was the right thing. The markets obviously didn't like it. There was no coordination with Europe ahead of time. There was no information with Europe ahead of time, no informing them it was going to happen. Um, the markets panicked at it. Uh, and of course, if everyone has selling European equities, which they did, um, and and you know, certainly us being not weighted into Europe was a help this week in the sense that uh, even as bad as U.S. equities did, European equities were really pummeled. And, and yet I will say that it isn't like you can hammer European equities and not hammer U.S. I mean, there was margin selling and forced selling and, and asset allocation that overlaps that just trickled into all capital markets, all risk assets. Okay, so that... The reaction of the market to the president's, you know, national address on uh, Wednesday night obviously was pretty bad. Um, but perhaps, you know, from a policy standpoint, we'll see what, what impact it has. But the biggest issue is what they're calling social distancing, uh, various congregations, large groups of people. Um, just they're kind of putting American life on hold to some degree, and and especially American public life. So movie theaters are going to be very uh, empty Broadway shows here in New York City have been canceled. Um, yeah, sporting events everywhere, you know, all of that going on. Uh, you have some high profile people that have been diagnosed with coronavirus, the Prime Minister of Canada's wife, Tom Hanks, famous actor and his wife, uh, two different NBA players on the same team. So it's just been a barrage of these headlines of, of things being bad. Um, it's still a very low uh, count of people diagnosed with it that we know of. There's very, very low testing been done. So that number is most certainly going to go up and the market's well aware it's going to go up. The market doesn't know how much though. And then um, the two things that are very encouraging is the cure rate continues to be extremely high. Uh, people that are diagnosed and get better um, and, and particularly in, in other countries, it, it's been very encouraging to see some of that. And then the mortality rate has still been very, very low, but it's obviously much higher than the flu. And so to the extent um, that the 
percentage of people who get it, there's a higher percentage who will pass away from it, and that cannot be accepted. That's a scary thing, and and so there, you know, that the whole thing is scary, and 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 uh, it's created uncertainty and it's created a panic. Um, it's not for me to sit here and say right now where I think some of the panic has been unwarranted, where I think it's unwarranted. Because first of all, I'm really only talking to you all in my context as an investment professional, as a fiduciary manager. And I also don't know. I, I'm certainly not a medical professional, but I also don't know that even medical professionals know because it really is uncertain exactly you know, where this thing is headed. And that is what has largely caused markets to sell, sell, sell is uncertainty is a very difficult pill to swallow. Um, one of the most important things I can say to anybody listening right now is that the notion of this being a bottom that we hit yesterday has got to be rid from your mind. Um, I think it could be. Uh, I wouldn't bet on it. Um, but we have, I think, four times now in the last three weeks had thousand point up days and none of them that held. Uh, maybe it's three times, three times. Um, and now this is the fourth and we'll see what happens. Um, but also, you're just very susceptible until we get on the other side of the healthcare aspect. You're very susceptible to the market continuing to trade with the headlines and the headlines aren't good. Now, that's when we'll, we'll, we'll know things have changed because there is coming a time when the market's going to stop responding to the headlines because it's already priced in, it's already baked in. We know there'll be another school closing. We know there'll be, God forbid, a certain contamination area and a celebrity and a this and that, you know, and, and it is awful. I don't, I don't uh, belittle any of it. But when the market stops responding to all those things, it means that that part of the bad is really baked in. And the whole thing becomes a very economic proposition at that point as far as markets are concerned, which is how severe will earnings end up being affected and how low will economic growth go and that's going to take a little time uh, to, to sort through. Um, so with those kind of uncertainties, is the best play for someone to just go on the sideline and wait? Well, if they knew this was all happening three weeks ago and they could have uh, been on the sideline at that time, then I guess it would have been a pretty good thing. But nobody knew. And by the time anyone could have looked up, um, they, they were down so much, it was, you were stuck. Um, so what have we done about that? And what do we continue to do? Um, we asset allocate. And so equities go down 25% and clients with 50 to 55% of their money in stocks and, and 25 in bonds and 20 in alternatives and things like that end up with a very different return result. Now, I don't like being down 8% or 10% either, um, but I do think 10 is a more palatable number than 25 um, I think for some people, 25 is palatable, uh, recognizing it as such an extremely rare event and they don't need the money. But see, every client's different that way. Every investor is different. So uh, one gets a chance to really kind of test their own natural risk profile, their natural comfort level of volatility in periods like this. It's not just rehearsal, though. It's really happening. But there's some other things really happening, too. Companies are still paying dividends. Every company we own. Companies are still going forward with dividend growth that they've already announced and already planned. Companies are looking at stock buybacks with lower um, stock prices in the wake of what's happened. Companies have an opportunity now to look at acquiring other assets where other companies maybe will be more affected by this. So it creates different um, acquisition targets. Uh, you, there's a lot of moving parts. And I made the analogy yesterday in, in a kind of emergency dividend cafe that I did to 9-11 and to the financial crisis. And in both cases, you had world-changing events, you had national, you know, nation-changing events, and, and it just felt like um, you were punched in the gut and you didn't know how long you were going to be out of breath. And, and in this case, I think that that feeling is where people have naturally gone of just how bad can it get, where do we go? And the reason I believe that the best psychological device is to literally just wait a few months to get very engaged with equity accounts. I can't do that because I need to be in the market every day, deploying cash where it's appropriate, rebalancing where it's appropriate, 
We have some significant decisions to make in our investment committee Monday. Um, if there's going to be a more prolonged recession, do we really want to rebalance right now from bonds to stocks? Or do we maybe want to rebalance some part of out of our bonds into dry powder that will be prepared to go into stocks, but it will be tethered in over time instead of put in all at once? Those are decisions we have to make, and I don't want to speak for what the investment committee will decide. Um, but you could probably guess from the way I'm talking as chief investment officer, the way I'm leaning right now. But I have a, a weekend of thousands of pages of research to read, and I have um, a lot of prayers to utter and thoughts to reflect on. But um, that, you know, that's my job, and that's the part that I don't believe our clients need to worry about as much as avoiding the temptation to respond to something that's awful permanent uh, but awful temporarily by making it awful permanently. And unfortunately, you know, there's always going to be that kind of natural temptation. Um, but we are adamant that uh, those who are able to wait this thing out, whether it's three weeks, three months, or nine months, um, most of China has gone back to work. Uh, South Korea has had unbelievable improvement preparing to normalize. We, we now see Italy's draconian measures as they get back into a place. The U.S. still has an extraordinarily low amount of folks who have passed from this awful thing. Uh, diagnosis have gone up, um, but again, can the, can the worst outcome still be avoided? They most certainly can. So the two different ways in which it can go are totally unknown. In the meantime, uh, we're going to find out here in a little bit where some of the sort of quote-unquote fiscal stimulus is. Uh, I lay out in Divin Cafe this week a lot of what they're looking at doing there. Um, or the monetary side, we know the Fed has been providing a lot of liquidity into the repo market. Um, and now today announced a lot of treasury bond transactions uh, meant to kind of steepen out the yield curve a little bit. Brought 30-year yields much higher. Uh, yield curve is the steepest today it's been in some time. Uh, I have not yet spoken on this podcast about the what took place on Monday with uh, the oil prices dropping 30% overnight on Sunday. Um, and I think that that leaves us in a position where um, now you, you wonder if there's a trickle-down effect. Oil markets being so low, it hurts certain producers, hurts the credits, hurts the banks that are uh, behind some of that. Um, I don't I don't think that we can answer exactly right now where Saudi Arabia and Russia are going to go with some of this. But what I really do believe is that um, whether the market ends up fading this rally today at the end or the market ends up rallying further or next week is an up week or next week's a down week, um, I believe we're so much closer to a bottom than a top and that on a risk reward calculation basis that it behooves people to stick to what was hopefully going into this situation, a properly allocated plan. Um, I've been looking over client accounts all day. I mean, starting like at three in the morning, going till 10 or 11 at night, literally every day. And I do really feel, even with the pain I see in equity markets, that our allocations have been right. And that one of the things that equity investors have to live with are these moments where markets uh, drop precipitously and this one was particularly precipitous, particularly quick, and particularly uh, dramatic. And so our view is absolutely unwavering that this will pass, there will be healthcare resolution, there will be monetary stimulus for good or for bad that comes, there will be fiscal stimulus for good or for bad that comes, and that some of the very negative things that are priced into the markets right now will turn. And whether it is Q3, whether it's, you know, um, the economy will likely turn after the market. The market won't wait for the economy as it prices things in advance. And indeed, the economy and the data obviously has not yet turned, but the market was pricing in this week what they expect will end up being the case. And that's where we are. So it is difficult for me to um, record this in the middle of market day, even though we're near the end of the day, because I am so aware of the incredible vulnerability market has to move very quickly one way or the other and have my information be obsolete. But when I look through Dividend Cafe, um, 
I guess I would just really ask you if you have the time to read it this week. Because I can't go through on the podcast all the points I make about the oil price war, about monetary policy specifics, about fiscal policy, where we stand on the healthcare side, um, what data needs to you know be presented uh, that can that can make the markets feel better about the direction we're going. Um, understanding on the healthcare side the fatality rate, uh, where these disease, where the deaths from the disease fit into the big picture, and then um, how you ought to think about this stuff as an investor, what it means for those in retirement wanting to go to retirement. Um, I ask eight questions. I think every investor needs to ask themselves, and I really would love for you to go spend a little time with that. Um, because I think that the answers to those questions may very well have a lot to do with what ought to happen with your portfolio right now and what ought to happen in your portfolio later. Um, so I, I will leave it there. I'm going to close out with a quote <clears throat> that I put in uh, DividendCafe.com this week, but it's a quote that I actually had taped to my desk. An old executive at uh, my former employer, Morgan Stanley, had given it to me on September 17th, 2008. Uh, that was the day my dad would have turned 60. I talk about this in the podcast and, and writing series I did a year and a half ago, year and four months ago, whatever, uh, commemorating the 10 year anniversary of the financial crisis. And the, on September 17th was the day that Morgan Stanley uh, looked like it may be going under. So, so Lehman Brothers, AIG, Merrill Lynch had all gone down that week. Um, there were other major financial players on Wall Street in disarray. The market was down thousands of points, much bigger percentages. You know, Credit markets were blowing up. Banks were closing. And uh, someone turned me on to this quote from an old British poet named John Dryden. Um, I am a little wounded, but I am not slain. I will lay me down and bleed a while. Then I'll rise up and fight again. So I took that and I taped it up to my desk. And I, uh, I read it on my desk every single day through the entire financial crisis, which was um, a life-changing and career-changing period of time for me. And on March 9th, 2009, I took it down. Um, and, and we, we were on the anniversary of March 9th this last week. And I took it down um, because I believed that uh, we had survived the financial crisis. And in the course of a couple of days, markets rebounded 20%. The economy stayed in recession for a year. Unemployment stayed very, very high for two years. Um, but we troughed. And those of us who laid down and bled a bit um, were, not, were not killed, it got up to fight again. And, and at the risk of this sounding more dramatic than it is, um, everybody is going to be fine. Nobody's financial goals are going to be undermined. It, 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 it can feel when markets are collapsing with no bottom in sight differently. Um, and even when things stop, do bottom, the recovery can take a lot of time. One of the problems when you're afraid of more downside to uh, going to the sidelines is the fact that when a rebound comes, there's a big portion of it that comes so quickly. And when one misses it, um, they eliminate the mathematical possibility of that full recovery in prices that they may want to achieve. And that's one of the reasons why I've studied this so much and I'm so adamant that even though it may be the path of least resistance, the last thing I would do with my own personal money, let alone client money, is go take advantage of the opportunity to hide in the sideline after the most violent of the burst has already taken place. So I don't know where this market will bottom. I am assuming it will go lower. I'm hoping it will not, but I'm assuming it will. Uh, but I am very confident that wherever it ends up bottoming, there will be rapidity to the upside. It will move quickly when it's ready to respond to improved healthcare data. And then when it improves, uh, when it responds to improved healthcare data, the fundamentals of the economy started off strong enough that it will fertilize a reasonably good and quick exit from the weakness that the economy is now about to suffer. And it will then be coupled by incredible monetary stimulus 
that will boost up equity valuations. And I can't bear the idea of clients missing out on that recovery after a week like we've just had and after three weeks like we've just had. So I'd rather have more bad days on our way to some great months than miss out on that. And, and that's the way I feel about it. And I could talk to you about this all day. Any client uh, listening you'd like to talk, please reach out to us. Talk to your private wealth advisor. Talk to me directly. Email, call, whatever you want. And we're going to host a national conference call on this subject on Tuesday. That information has been sent to you. So with that, I will say goodbye to this uh, week for the history books and um, a week that hopefully will not be repeated anytime soon. But the history of markets tells us it will be. All right now, my thoughts and prayers are with the families of those uh, who have been diagnosed with the disease. May you be one of the 55 to 60% of people that have already been cured. May you be one of the 96 to 98% of people that um, sort of survived it. And, and may we get a, a cure and a vaccine and, and may this uh, deadly killer um, be no part of American or global life anytime soon. And God bless you and your families. And I thank you for your trust and confidence in the Bonson Group. And I welcome ongoing communication throughout this period. And to the extent that you don't need to communicate or want to communicate because you just want to wait it out a few months, I commend you. Um, I believe you'll be happy you did. We'll continue working. Take care. Have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to the Dividend Cafe.